Trade-offs, comparative advantage, and the market system. Okay, we've talked a little bit about trade-offs and we introduced scarcity last module. Remember that's just where we have unlimited wants and a limited number of resources available to meet those wants. So uh, how do we make this, what's, what are the, maybe the best decisions about using those scarce resources? That's what we're, that's the tools that we're going to develop here in this section. Because scarcity is going to require trade-offs. So when Tesla, for example, is going to produce sedans and SUVs, it has a limited amount of workers and a limited number of machines to be able to do that. What's going to be the best, the optimal allocation in production between SUVs and sedans? To, we're going to continue on with that example of Tesla in a second. We're going to use a production possibilities frontier, a PPF. That's just a curve showing the maximum attainable combinations of two products that can be purchased with available resources and current technology. So is this a positive or normative tool, a PPF? Remember that distinction? A positive shows what is versus a normative which shows what, what should be. So a PPF is just it's a positive assessment. What is? What can be produced given uh, current technology and available resources? Okay, so here's an example of a PPF. Uh, Tesla can produce, notice we have here, sedans or SUVs on this axis. And given its current resources, that balance of labor and machinery, if it can produce 80 sedans. And if it produces 80 sedans, that means there will be no SUVs produced. So anywhere along this line here would be feasible combinations of the two, amount of sedans and SUVs. So if it makes 60 sedans, it could produce 20 SUVs. Okay, points inside the curve would be inefficient. That means we could, we could produce this amount, but this is less than what, what we could actually attain uh, using our current resources and technology, right? So if we, um, we could produce 30 sedans and 10 SUVs, yeah, sure, that's fine. But we could also, if we were producing 30, we could go all the way out here on the uh, on the efficient line here, and we could produce about 50, right? Um, so anywhere inside this curve would be inefficient. All of our resources aren't being used in production. Outside the curve, on the other hand, are not these points are not attainable. Anything out here we cannot produce given our current uh, technology and available resources. Okay, so here's where the trade-offs come in. In order to move, say, from A to B, uh, Tesla faces a trade-off. So in order to go from at A, we are at 80 sedans and zero SUVs. If they want to produce 20 SUVs, they're going to have to give up some of the amount of sedans that they were producing. So go, to go from 80 to 80 and zero to this point, 60 and 20, they're having to give up 20 sedans to produce 20 SUVs. So in this case, it's just a trade-off that's one-to-one, -one, right? For every sedan, uh, sedan they give up, they get one additional SUV. So let's couch that in the language that we used before, opportunity cost. Remember, that is the highest valued alternative that must be given up to engage in an activity. So those 20 fewer sedans and moving from A to B, they lose 20 sedans. That is the opportunity cost of producing 20 more SUVs. They have to give up 20 sedans to get 20 SUVs. Okay, on that last side, we had a linear PPF, right? It was just a straight line. So opportunity costs were constant. Uh, but opportunity costs aren't necessarily constant. In fact, typically the way we want, the way we want to think about them is that they are increasing. So here, uh, at first, um, to get 200 automobiles, to go from 0 to 200, we only have to give up 50 tanks. Now, this is not the Tesla example. We have tanks and automobiles. So to make... 200 automobiles, we have to give up 50 tanks. Over here, however, to go from B to C, now uh, to get 200 additional automobiles, we have to give up 150 tanks. So now we're giving up more tanks to get the same amount of automobiles. Why might, be, why might this be the case? This makes good sense. Some resources are going to be better suited to producing tanks than they would be for automobiles. So the first resources we give up here, they're actually probably better suited to making automobiles anyway. But by the time we get over here, moving from B to C, and certainly if we move from C to right here, we're giving up resources that are best, better suited to producing tanks than they would be for automobiles, and we're forcing them to make automobiles instead.
So this is a general uh, principle here that you want to be familiar with. Increasing marginal opportunity costs. The more resources already devoted to an activity, the smaller the payoff to devoting additional resources to that activity. So by the time we get over here and we're giving up tanks for automobiles, it becomes more and more costly. We have to give up more and more tanks to get additional automobiles. Okay, economic growth and the PPF. So remember I said before, inside here were unattainable. Outside was, um, I mean, sorry, inside here was inefficient. Outside here was unattainable, right? Given a level of technology and current resources. But if we have economic growth, that extends the PPF outward. So now we're going from A to B. So now things that we can produce things before that were unattainable now become attainable because of economic growth. So economic growth is just the economy um, is increasing. There's an increased production of goods and services. So shifts outward would be economic growth, uh, shift outward of the PPF. Okay, we can also show technological change in one industry, right? Changing the shape of the PPF here. Um, there's no change in the, in the technology for tanks, that, so that still stays at 400. But now, uh, say we have some new technological improvement in the construction of, in the manufacturing of automobiles. So now we can produce more automobiles overall, shifting, kind of twisting this PPF outward, shifting just this one part here. Not a shift of the whole curve, right? Um, but a shift because there's some advance in automobile manufacturing. So now many of the previously unattainable combinations are available, right? Anything outside this initial one was unattainable before, but now we can reach lots of them over here that we couldn't reach before. Okay, so imagine that you have a limited amount of time to study for two exams in economics and accounting. What would the PPF for this look like? You think it would be a straight line with constant opportunity costs or a bowed outward curve, like what we saw with tanks and, and uh, automobiles. It's going to be bowed outward because the first hour spent studying economics is much more valuable than the last hour, right? It's a, it's a case of increasing opportunity costs, which we associate with that bowed outward curve. And the more resources devote, already devoted to an activity, the smaller gain there is from devoting additional resources to that activity. So by the time you studied 10 hours for economics, right, adding another hour isn't going to be as much. It would be much more valuable spending some time studying accounting instead. All right, comparative advantage. This is going to be a key concept. You're going to want to spend some time studying the examples in the book and make sure you get a handle on how this works. Okay, so we got two people here, you and your neighbor, uh, and you're picking fruit, cherries and apples. Now, if you spend all your time picking cherries, you can pick 20 pounds. Uh, if you spend all your time picking apples, you can also pick 20 pounds. So here's your PPF. Anything on here is efficient and attainable. Anything in here is inefficient. Anything out here is unattainable. So you can pick any combination on this line is going to be efficient. Your neighbor, on the other hand, is just a better fruit picker for whatever reason. If she spends all her time picking apples, she can pick 30 pounds. If she spends all her time picking cherries, she can pick 60 pounds. And anything on that line is attainable and efficient. Okay, now your neighbor is just a better picker of fruit than you are. So what's going to happen if you decide to specialize in trade with your neighbor? And trade is just buying and selling, right? Apples and cherries, that voluntary exchange idea that we talked about before. So could your neighbor benefit from trade? We saw that she's just better at picking both apples and cherries, right? Yes, you both can benefit from trade by specializing in what you are relatively good at. Relatively good at. So your neighbor has an absolute advantage, but you both have relative advantage, a comparative advantage. Okay, so here we go. Here's your PPF, and say you choose somewhere in the middle. Uh, that's your consumption without trade. All right, and here is your neighbor's consumption before trade. So we're on that efficient line. We're spending all our time balancing between picking cherries and apples. Both you and your neighbor are picking both of those, okay? If we specialize, though, now you're going to pick right here instead. You're only going to pick apples, spending all your time picking apples, and your neighbor is going to spend all of her time picking cherries, okay? So now she's picking 60 pounds of cherries, and you're picking 20 pounds of apples. 
If you trade some of your apples, now 10 pounds of your apples, for 15 pounds of your neighbor's cherries, you're going to be able to consume 10 pounds of apples and 15 pounds of cherries. So now you are out here. This point was unattainable before when it was just you on your own PPF, right? Now you're reaching this out here, your consumption now with trade compared to before, and your neighbor is also better off. This point D was unattainable before, so your neighbor is getting more of both apples and cherries, just like you're getting more of both apples and cherries. Okay, now this, this specific, don't let this specific number here, this trade-off, throw you off. There's a range here of what would be mutually beneficial trades, and these are just picked. Uh, this is just somewhere within that range. So the big point is, though, that with specialization, uh, consumption after trade is going to be higher for both you and your neighbor, right? These numbers, uh, 8 versus 10, 12 versus 15, 9 versus 10, 42 versus 15, there is some mutually beneficial exchange that can happen after specialization, and so everyone is better off. These gains aren't divided evenly. That depends on the terms of trade, how exactly you decide to uh, what the terms are agreed on between you and your neighbor. Like I said, don't, don't worry so much about that. But this is the, the really cool thing about it. Even though your neighbor had an absolute advantage in picking cherries and apples, both of you are better off from specializing in trade. Okay, so he, yeah, here's this, here's this idea. Your neighbor has that absolute advantage, so she can pick more cherries and more apples, right? But you have a comparative advantage in picking apples. Okay, absolute advantage is pretty straightforward. That is just you're able to produce more, you pick more cherries, more apples, right, using the same amount of resources, in this case the same amount of time. The comparative advantage, though, this is going to be the, the new thing. Um, a individual firm or country can produce a good or service at a lower opportunity cost than competitors. Okay, so take a look at this. So this is now the opportunity cost of picking one pound of apples. Remember, you, you were 20 and 20. So if you produce, if you pick apples, you're giving up a pound of cherries. If you pick cherries, you're giving up a pound of apples. Your neighbor, however, was 30 and 60, right? Uh, let me go back to that real quick. Yeah, 30 and 60. 30 pounds of apples versus 60 pounds of cherries. So that ratio is a one or is a two or a one half ratio, right? So when your neighbor picks two pound, so when your neighbor picks one pound of apples, she has to give up two pounds of cherries because of that 30 to 60 ratio. Similarly, when she, your neighbor picks one pound of cherries, she has to give up a half a pound of apples. So this is the, the key thing that you want to see here. The basis for trade is comparative advantage, not absolute advantage. Comparative advantage is based on the lowest opportunity cost. So uh, you have a lower opportunity cost of picking apples, right? One, you only have to give up one pound of cherries. Your neighbor has to give up two. Your neighbor has to give up half a pound of apples. You would have to give up a whole pound of apples. So you are going to specialize in picking apples up here because you have the lowest opportunity cost, and your neighbor specializes in picking cherries because she has the lowest opportunity cost. So comparative advantage is the basis for trade. Okay, here's another example. You can look through it. Um, it's like the same thing we just did with cherries and apples.